in recent years, and in fact, I think it's pretty clear from the recent election that the public trust of the political elite and the corporate elite has been severely shaken. The perception is that these institutions are failing to safeguard the public, to protect the public interest. Their franchise or brands, their very legitimacy is being questioned. And whether in a postmodern capitalist society, whether these institutions are a social force or being used against uh, society. In this uh, segment, we're going to talk about enterprise risk management and some of the issues that you're going to be facing as, as stewards and fiduciaries of the postmodern corporation. Assessing risk is absolutely critical in forming an opinion on the legitimacy and the accuracy of the financial statements of, of the corporation. And some of the risk attributes that you need to consider is, of course, systemic risk, which is, of course, industry risk. Also, issues in high inflation periods, interest rate risk, which uh, could sink a, a business because it can't leverage like it did in low interest rate environments. Liquidity risk, that's the, uh, you know, how much cash the company has and whether it's able to meet its uh, current and future obligations. Asset quality risk, not as important as it used to be because tangible assets make up a much lower portion of the modern service corporation. And there's a couple of other risks, like fiduciary and corporate uh, management risk, which is the risk of you missing something or corporate management obscuring something, which again, uh, could hurt the public. There's also processing risk, which is third-party transactions and operational risk and others. We're going to focus on, only on a couple of the risk elements, which are the ones that you're going to be looking at as legal compliance executives, as risk managers, as fiduciaries and stewards of the corporation, and wearing your ethical hat, whether you may want to raise your hand and, and shout, there's something wrong here. Let's take a look at systemic risk. And it's something that keeps rearing its ugly head from the years 2000 to 2002, 2007 to 2009, and, and more recently, some of the the larger bankruptcies that, that we're seeing, and uh, frankly, some of the pharmaceutical companies that have had some serious issues. The dramatic failure of risk management, especially in financial institutions, the dramatic failure of risk management in many systemically important financial institutions was really the key to the collapse of the banking system in that period of 2007 to 2009. So we're going to talk about enterprise risk and it's based on the conclusions after the financial meltdown of the Financial Inquiry Commission report that this financial crisis was avoidable. And I think you're going to see, and we'll discuss it later, that a lot of the elements that led to the building up of the bubble in the 2007 to 2009 time period are actually very similar to the bubble that's forming because of the low interest rate environment and the hedging and the leveraging of debt as a result. We talked a little about shadow banks, but this is probably critical because the banking system, a, a stable, solid banking system is absolutely key to the financial well-being of a society. But we talked a little about the shadow banks operating out of the traditional banking system, avoiding many of the capital requirements imposed on banks. And prior to the crisis, these institutions, and we have to take a look at them again, Merrill Lynch, essentially bankrupt, forced to merge with Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, and we saw Morgan was just uh, hit with a, a, a major uh, violation recently. Fannie and Freddie also went bankrupt. And take a look at the leverage today versus the way it was before the economic recession. Lehman Brothers, we know about Lehman. And Fidelity and Vanguard, these mutual fund entities literally had to be backstopped by the federal government so that the dollar a share leverage that they use was not was not broken. They said you can't break the dollar. So that any dollars that you had in Vanguard and Fidelity stayed worth a dollar and couldn't and wasn't uh, decreased because they were hedging 
your, your cash investments. And then, of course, there was Federated and all the other stores that needed to be backstopped by the federal government uh, to avoid what we call breaking the buck in the customer counts under a Depression Era Emergency Act. So by 2007, the shadow banking system was $13 trillion and exceeded the traditional uh, banking system assets as a whole until the recession. And then the leverage curve accelerated from a historical rate of 18 to 1, this is Fannie and Freddie, to a staggering 40 to 1 by 2008, the ratio of the top shadow banks in America. At Fannie and Freddie, the fiduciaries, the stewards of Fannie and Freddie, the politicians, the senators and congressmen, must have seen that the leverage ratio climbed to an unprecedented and unsustainable 75 to 1, which ultimately required backstopping by the federal government to save these lenders from bankruptcy and seizing the capital markets. Now, what do we mean by this leverage? For every $75 loan by Fannie and Freddie, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, this is the lender of last resort, and they backstopped basically all the banks that were allowed to uh, do no credit checks and no income checks, which is back again, by the way. For every $75 loan by Fannie and Freddie, and these kings of leverage had only a dollar in capital to cover their losses. To put this leverage ratio in perspective, this is the consumer equivalent of borrowing $1.6 million with only $50,000 in total assets, total cash in the account. The interesting issue is that through enactment of Sarbanes-Oxley, the new Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, as we discussed before, had the opposite effect on these banks because of, of 4,000 of 11,500 of the SEC registered advisors, according to the North American Securities Administrators Association, were removed from federal legislation, federal regulation, this is, that is SEC regulation, and shifted to individual states. And some states, in fact, not only don't have the finances, regulatory authority, framework, or manpower to effectively manage enforcement, they had no administration or even no knowledge of how to uh, administer these advisors. And I think this is going to bite us over the next couple of, of years. I'd like to talk a little about John Corsine's MF Global because that was a typical off-balance sheet transaction. And everybody knew it within MF Global. It was a, an exposure on its repurchase agreements. And what's fascinating about it is that the total equity of the company, and it was stated that way, was $1.3 billion. That is the assets minus liabilities and some shareholders uh, equity. The total equity of the company was $1.3 billion. But off balance sheet financing, that is the amount de-recognized or taken off the financial statements was $14.5 billion. Year over year growth of these balance sheet transactions was even more frightening as it grew from $5.7 billion the year before, an increase of 300%. It was a, more amazing was that 53% was collateralized with sovereign European debt. And then in 2011, and that's not that long ago, it then repledged $9.9 .9 billion of securities, which aggregated then to the 13.1. Now, what would you do as a fiduciary or a steward when you see this happening within Lehman Brothers? Would you raise your hand and say, stop this? Would you leave or would you report this, that the financial statements were no longer accurate because of off-balance sheet transactions? Now, it's also acknowledged that the bankruptcy of Lehman was the catalyst for, for precipitating the global financial crisis. And we're just really emerging from it. And in fact, the average per capita income of Americans has not exceeded that of, of, of pre-recession levels. But by 2007, Lehman Brothers was one of the top five shadow banks, had a leverage ratio, which was average about 40 to one. It was half that of Fannie and Freddie. Had grown 100% greater, had grown 100% greater than the average leverage of traditional banks, such as JP Morgan. And more critical was the fundamental business model and tolerance for unsustainable risk 
has shifted dramatically between 97 and 2006. By 2006, revenue from trading and principal investments at Lehman Brothers, including the securitization and derivative activities, was 80% of pre-tax earnings. It was up from 32% in 1997. So what's tremendously interesting is that effectively Lehman Brothers was illiquid. It could not cover the repurchase agreements that had been growing. In fact, at Merrill, it was said that when the head of Merrill was told by his subordinates that collateral debt obligations, collateral mortgage obligations were exceeding that of the norm within the industry, it was said that he fired many of those people. Would you stand up to the CEO of Merrill Lynch and tell him that he was wrong? Would you leave? Would you allow yourself to get fired? An interesting point by the Wall Street Journal. This is fiduciary risk. Big crises, big financial crises are usually followed by big criminal convictions. In the early 2000s, numerous executives were imprisoned for their roles in accounting frauds. But three years after the greatest collapse in 80 years, that is, 2009, 2010, now 2013, 2014, three years after the greatest collapse in 80 years, there have been no similar market con uh, landmark convictions with the notable exception of Bernie Madoff. Uh, well, let's take a look at the relationship between financial fraud and management responsibility. Remember that in the accounting literature, as we said, accountants fix principal responsibility on financial reporting on management. Financial statements are the judgment of management, and management alone is responsible for the financials. I wrote a piece in the Financial Fraud Law Review after uh, some of the meltdown. I just want to repeat some of the shocking statistics. According to a 10-year study by the Securities and Exchange Commission, almost three-quarters of the frauds were committed by management, actually the chief executive officer, or with the knowledge of the CEO. A staggering 63%, this is a SEC study, staggering 63% of chief financial officers today believe they can intentionally misstate financial statements. And 82% of the CFOs believe that auditors will not catch them, which is actually a 10% increase since the last study. As you know, not all material misstatements constitute fraud, but materially misleading financial reports constitute failure of the fiduciaries and the stewards of the company to protect the publics, to protect the stakeholders. And that's absolutely critical. I'd like to talk a little about reserve risk because in accounting literature, there are dozens if not hundreds of reserve accounts. And if you work in the financial services industry, it's very different than working for a store because if you work for a retail establishment, a service organization, or even Amazon or Google, where you're selling products or services over the internet, most firms reserve for returns. They reserve for refunds. They reserve for discounts and allowances. They reserve for bad debts. They reserve for theft and inventory shrinkage and damaged goods. But in the banking financial services industry, according to a widely syndicated author, commentary, bank analyst, Dick Bovey, in banks, there are no reserves. In fact, the principal reason why we can't determine what a bank generally earned, according to Bovey, is that there are no reserve whatsoever in the banking system. Financial institutions constitute 27% of the U.S. gross domestic product. That was prior to the meltdown. The inability to assess the true risk of off-balance sheet financing at, say, long-term capital management AIG, again, the largest global bankruptcy in history, Lehman, MF Global, to adequately reserve against balance sheet financial risk has sunk the larger shadow banks. And Bove asserts that accounting is used currently in the financial services industry, um, and effectively, it, as it is used, it is among the worst accounting anywhere in the world and that anyone ever thought of. He said no one could look at a bank statement anymore, get a feel for how cash is moving through the system. No one can identify what the SEC requires, which is to determine what the bank actually earned over a specific period of time. And the question is how transparent 
as an executive, as a fiduciary, as a steward of the bank will you be? I'd also like to talk a little about the hidden risk. And we, we talked about this a little before, but I'd like to go a little further with this. To maintain a, hap, a, a healthy financial system, investors, vendors, employees, customers, and governments must be able to trust in the financial results of the enterprise. All risks, all risks must be visible and out in the open. Fluctuat nec mergitur, according to uh, Nassim Taleb, the author of The Black Swan, it fluctuates but does not sink, as I've bastardized the Latin language. In order for the financial system to work, what is needed is a system that can prevent the harm done to citizens by the dishonesty of business elites, the limited competency of forecasters, economists, and statisticians, and the imperfections of regulation. I don't think there's a stronger argument for your public interest and ethical responsibility within a company than, than the statement by uh, Nassim Taleb in his book, The Black Swan. As Nassim said, although black swans emerged from hiding over the past four years, this is post, uh, you know, the Great Recession, they had emerged many times before over the past hundred years, maybe not necessarily looking the same. Enron, WorldCom, dot-com bubble, collapse of 3,000 savings and loan institutions in the 80s, recent failures of AIG, Lehman, MF Global, and others. These were companies that were given clean opinions by the auditors, Management, of course, uh, said nothing, and these the largest global corporate failures in history, and nobody knew about them till they went bust. The perspective, though, however, as I argued before, is that bankruptcy and recession, from a societal perspective, is not a victimless crime, because what we did is we transferred unemployment and starvation to third world countries as a result because we said nothing within the financial and the, um, the bank institutions as to warning signs of, guys, we've got we've to slow down a little. I'd like to talk a little about business model risk. One of the great, and I think this is really interesting because it's quantitative risk, and it may be beyond our study, but I think it's fascinating because sometimes we refer to the gurus of, of the world and think that they know best. One of the greatest advances in modern portfolio theory was made by Nobel Prize winners Robert Merton and Myron Scholes in the 80s. They were considered geniuses. Their ideas of portfolio theory inspired risk management of possible outcomes thanks to sophisticated calculations. They were all, now, every business school in America taught modern portfolio theory. Merton and Scholes founding part, were also far, founding partners of the speculative trading firm called Long-Term Capital Management. And during the summer of 1998, harbinger of what was to come 10 years later, LTCM went bust and almost took down the entire financial system with it as the exposures were massive. And of course, uh, Nassim Taleb says, so the Gaussian bell curve pervaded our business and scientific cultures in terms such as Sigma variance, standard deviation, correlation, T-square, and the uh, sharp ratio, generated theorems and proofs. The mathematics is tight and elegant. And I think as fiduciaries and stewards, you've got to be careful when you're bombarded by other executives and some of the, the more statistically focused uh, financial reporting types by the, what they say. For example, if you read a description of a hedge fund and how they address exposure to risk, the odds are that they will supply you with other information with quantitative summary claiming to measure risk. Now, before MF Global went bankrupt, the, they, they talked, I, I, saw, I pulled this out of the financial statements of MF Global, their probability measures, the confidence levels, and the sovereign debt. And this, is, this comes from right from the financial statements before they went bust. MF Global Risk Management uses a Monte Carlo simulation methodology with an estimated 95% confidence level over a one-day time horizon with an end day-to-day -day valuation at risk of $3 million high, $6 million low, but that does not include investments held to maturity, repo to market transactions, which killed them, by the way, investments made for asset liability management. 
This is 2011 March. The impact on the value of a 10 basis point move of sovereign credit spread and the repurchase rate financing is approximately $8.3 million. There were no amounts, this is again from their financials, there were no amounts at risk under repurchase agreements that accounted for as collateralized financing transactions with counterparties greater than 10% of equity. And brokerage activities in the OTC markets maintain a future style margin methodology which allows us to reduce the amount of capital required to conduct business because we were able to post client deposits rather than our own funds with clearing organizations if required in determining a required capital level. As Janet uh, Tavacoli, president of Tavacoli Structured Finance, outspoken critic of the securities industry wrote, we haven't learned much from American international groups and long-term capital management debacles. It's so clear. You can be swayed as a fiduciary, as a steward of the company. You can be swayed by all the statistics and the inferences and the probability measures of why this company will not go bankrupt. And if Global went bankrupt. Let's finally talk about going concern risk. We talked a little about it before, but I'd like to look at it slightly differently. The question is, was MF Global, and I like to use it by example, was MF Global a going concern? In 2011, MF Global had a lower book value than its market capitalization. And then if you looked on the financials, and this is very important, there were a number of lawsuits, including allegedly unauthorized rogue trades. One major lawsuit was still on the books and had not been dismissed by the court. There were no reserves against it. Bank of Montreal sued MF Global for $500 million for fraudulent trading activity. And the cumulative total return of common shares over the past five years resulted in a loss of 70% of its value. It also underperformed other stocks within the stock exchange, the Morningstar Capital Markets Index, and basically Morningstar rates uh, similar companies on, on the basis of, of, of similar performance ratios, and it, and it rates them among its uh, uh, peers in the stock market. And its revenue dropped from $6 billion to $2 billion over a four-year period. It hadn't been profitable for almost five years. And, you know, the IRS presumes that a business is a hobby with only three years of losses. And there was a decrease in cash flow. The company was trying to be sold. Could not the fiduciaries and the advisors and the raiders of financial institutions have seen the collapse of MS, MF Global? And I would argue, of course they could. PCAOB concluded after reviewing the company's audits of the firm that auditors were found to miss significant errors how one company accounted for derivative securities, which sunk them. In retrospect, MF Global should not have been considered a going concern. Everybody in the company saw it. The management saw it. The fiduciary saw it. The steward saw it. The corporate counsel saw it. The risk managers saw it. The outside advisors, the legal folks saw it. The auditors saw it. The, uh, the rating services saw it. And the financial analysts saw it. And everybody said nothing. So this concludes our uh, section on risk management. The question I ask you is, if you saw it, would you say something?